Hey, nothing like starting a day and discussing wireless, right? That's so cool. Uh, so today we're going to talk about some good stuff on the digital transition. So we're going to talk a little bit about the advantage of digital wireless. So why does this whole thing about why digital is better? You know, why should I go to digital wireless? Uh, then we're going to discuss a little bit of why using them on UHF. You know, UHF is still the basically the best place to keep our wireless nowadays. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit of why, give you a little bit of a spectrum update, so we can uh, we can check what's going on with the 600 megahertz. The auction is basically at the end. So and. Uh, you know, wrap up with frequency coordination and talk a little bit about spectrum efficiency. So we, if you are watching this webinar, it's probably because you do work with wireless audio or are used to wireless audio. So um, this thing, it's a, what an email used to look like in 1947. So uh, as you probably know, Sure has been in business for almost 95 years and you know, we have a lot of stories, a lot of stories. And uh, this is a communication from Ben Bauer, who, by the way, is the guy who invented the uh, directional dynamic microphone with a Model 55. And he wanted to put a transmitter on a microphone. And he was worried about some possible FCC regulations, you know, for operation of such device. So... Thinking although we are, you know, many years after 1947, some things never change. So many years later, like 11 years later, in 1958, we got the Vagabond, which was basically our first professional wireless system. It was a big hit in Las Vegas. So nowadays we have to the we are at the point where the Landscape allows us to do some things with our wireless systems, but our customers are expecting way more. You know, for most of our customers, it's, you know, a wireless microphone is nothing more than a microphone with no wires. So what we have to keep in mind that for every wire we take from the stage, we add like four or five more backstage. And we need space to be able to broadcast independently all our channels. So why the digital wireless help us in this? So we're gonna go deep in uh, deeper in a little more of uh, all these details in a minute, but basically we have better audio quality. So we got a wider flutter frequency response increased dynamic range and signal to noise ratio. Uh, we don't have audible artifacts that are normally related, related to some things we have to do on the analog um, wireless. So we don't have those artifacts on the digital ones. We have a better spectral efficiency. So what do we mean by spectral efficiency? So we have a certain space of frequencies that we can use. So a TV channel occupied six megahertz of space. So within those six megahertz, how many wireless can I broadcast? How many microphones can I broadcast or microphones and IEFs? So with the digital systems, we can do way more than the analog. Uh, we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. So we have improved RF performance. So since we don't have a lot of intermodulation products, and we can get way more mics on the air, and we get a better resistance to multipath and interference. So it's harder, nowadays it's harder to have a dropout on a digital wireless than it is on the analog. And some of the cool things we can do with a digital, like encryption, where only the receiver that has been synced with your mic can actually get the audio. So let's talk about audio on the analog systems first, so we can understand why the digital is better. Um, when, the, our, when our signal is over the air, it 
it's being bombarded by all different sources of noise. So some of this noise can get into my audio after demodulated and they present hiss. So, right? So high frequency noise. Um, in order to mitigate that, what we do is we use a technique called pre-emphasis and de-emphasis, which is basically the same that we used to do back in the day with a tape recording. So we boost the high frequencies on the transmitter and we attenuate them on the same rate on the receiver. So what happens is whatever uh, noise that I get right in the middle would be not being previously amplified. So it will be only attenuated. Well, it works really well, but of course it has its limitation and it may, it may affect the frequency response depending on how you do it. So that's basically why we do it. So we have on the left, what would be the analog. So I'm sending my sine waves, my modulated sine waves, and they get a little bit of noise. So when I demodulate, that noise is part of my signal. If I go to the right, I have my carrier, I have my bit string because what I'm sending, is not sine waves anymore, but zeros and ones. I modulate that, that mod the modulated signal will get noise same way as the analog. The difference is that that noise, it's not reproduced on the audio direct because what I'm demodulating, what I'm extracting from that uh, radio signal are zeros and ones and not sine waves. So I don't get the noise on the digital system, so I don't need to do noise correction. The other thing we had to do on the FM signals is to uh, adapt our signal to be transmitted. You know, when I add sound to a carrier, so when I, when I modulate a carrier, I actually occupy certain uh, bandwidth. So I have, on the left, I have my carrier with no audio at all. So I, it's very skinny pick, let's say, you know, if you're talking to radio, let's say you're listening to 101.5, so that's your 101.5. On the right, I have the signal with audio. So I, I deviate from the center frequency a little bit, and there's only certain amount that I can deviate by FCC rules. The deal is the more I deviate, the louder my signal is, or maybe the other way around, right? The, the higher the amplitude of the signal that I'm modulating, the more that uh, I deviate. So in order to control my deviation, I actually have to compress my signal. So I compress on the transmitter and I expand on the receiver. So this called what we call compending, so compression and expanding. So basically I get my uh, full dynamic range, like 100 dB signal. I squeeze it to a 50 dB link, and then I expand it back to get my uh, better dynamic range back. Uh, the thing is that depending on how we compress and what techniques we use for that, we can have little artifacts and we can actually feel that compression depending on what I'm actually transmitting, right? So it's a very dynamic, like a bass player or something. You may hear actually the compending working. Um, on the digital systems, I don't have actually um, the need because I always occupy the full bandwidth. I always occupy 200 kilohertz, which is what the FCC allowed me to, and I don't have the need for a compending. So I have a very nice dynamic range. Another cool thing about the digital system is the way that we do diversity. So diversity is the need to use two different antennas, space it for at least a quarter of the wavelength, so we don't get the same dropout in both antennas, especially when you get from multipath, which is like reflections, signal mix at the antenna, the direct signal versus the reflected signal. So that's why I always look at the two antennas to see which one is better. With the digital systems, I actually have two bit streams being generated from the two different receivers 
and I sum them, go to an error correction process, and basically if there's any bit missing in one of them, the other one will compensate. So I have a perfect signal at the output. It's very resistant to multipath interference. Another possibility that we have, and this is very focused on one model, only the axiom digital on the uh, quad receiver has the option to do quad diversity, which is basically do the digital diversity, but now with four antennas instead of two antennas. So that can definitely help me with very complicated applications like uh, working on two different stages, you know, where I have my main stage, a catwalk, a secondary stage, so I can put two antennas on my secondary stage, two antennas on my main stage, and I don't have to worry about where my antennas are pointing, actually, you know, they all gonna get a very nice signal, no matter if I'm pointing at the main stage or if I'm pointing at the secondary stage. The uh, drawback for that is for a quad box, it becomes a two microphone box because I need to use basically channels one and two for mic one and channels three and four for mic two. Encryption is something that basically is it, the, where it really popular is on the digital systems because the implementation on the analog is very complicated. On the digital system, the signal is always encrypted so I always have a password, just like a Wi-Fi signal. So you can see a lot of Wi-Fi's on the air, but if you don't have the password and they enforce the use of the password, you cannot get in. That's the same thing that happens with a microphone. If you enforce the encryption, only the receivers that have been synced with your microphone will get the audio. The other ones will see the signal, but will not be able to get the audio out. So this gives us a lot of security, especially on applications like, you know, big boardrooms and, and, and important meeting rooms, court, courthouses and everything. One thing you have to keep in mind on the digital system and every digital system, uh, when, when we work with real-time audio has the issue of latency. So latency is basically, the time that our system needs to calculate everything. So we do perceive the latency differently depending on the application and each one of us will perceive latency different. Some people perceive more, some less, uh, but basically it's a cumulative effect. So my digital wireless have a little bit of latency. You know, we are now at the point where we can get down to 1.9 milliseconds, which is very short latency. But when you send that signal to your digital mixer, your digital mixer has some latency too. And if we process that with your super special, super cool plugin, that may have a latency too. And then if you get that out and send to a monitor, and you have a digital processor doing your biamp monitor or something, uh, you also gonna add some latency in that. So you have to keep in mind that you're gonna add them. And most of the time, you don't wanna go above five milliseconds total. So less than three milliseconds, most people will not even think about it, right? Between three and five, um, Oh, a trained ear can definitely recognize that there is something in there, but it's, you know, it's not a big deal. It's just like a little bit of delay. Uh, above five, then it gets really, really bad, especially for uh, people using in-ears, vocalists, or horn players. Um, the reference is actually faster because they feel the sound from their throat and their perception of latency is actually uh, higher. So you have to be really careful when we pass five milliseconds. For some people, it may be no big deal, uh, but you, know, you, you definitely may have issues and never go beyond 10 milliseconds because unless it's an application where we don't have to keep timing, 
so you are doing just voice and there's no monitors and stuff like that, then you should be uh, fine with that. So there's no problem at all. But if you really need to keep timing or you're getting a feedback from your own voice, yeah, definitely uh, below five milliseconds is the best place to be. Okay, so I convinced you that the digital wireless are better. Now what? Some things on your system, you don't have to change. Basically, the infrastructure that you use, as long as we are using the same frequency range, we don't have to worry. So all the antennas and accessories are the same. So if you're working on the UHF now, and you'll be working on the UHF with your digital systems, all the accessories are the same. All your antennas, all your amplifiers, your splitters, and everything. The infrastructure is the same. So if you're using a distro and you, you've been splitting the main signal to fitting like say four receivers, like in our example here, it's the same. It doesn't matter if my receiver is analog or digital, I can even mix and match them. It's gonna be all the same. Cables are the same, which is good. So um, as we, know that cables are really, really important on an RF system. So a good cable or a bad cable can make it or break it. And uh, we have to pay a lot of attention to that. The good thing, they are all the same. So if your structure is really nice on your analog system, just take a receiver, put a digital receiver in there, and all the stuff will work the same as long as we keep the same frequency range. So what I'm saying is that if I'm working on UHF, Everything on UHF should be fine. If I'm working on VHF, everything on the VHF should be fine. Okay, talking about UHF, what is happening on the spectrum allocation? Uh, there's something called the 600 megahertz auction that changed a lot of things, and uh, we should be aware. Uh, do you know that only 14% of Americans watch TV with antennas, like over the air TV, which is basically good TV with excellent quality and free, right? But only 14% of people use the antenna. But 81% of us have a smartphone. And I'm talking, not talking the old school cell phone, I'm talking smartphone, like a computer that is in your pocket. So we need space, we need spectrum space to transmit all that data. You know, we, keep, we, we have to keep watching our cat videos, right? So um, on the air, we, have, we are always bombarded by different frequency bands. And every frequency band has a specific purpose. That big blue continuous space that we have in there is the UHF television. The space between 300 megahertz and five gigahertz is considered beachfront, beachfront property, right? So it's, everybody wants to be there. Why? Propagation is good and the size of the antennas needed are very manageable. So I can definitely work well with those antennas and the propagation is very good for what I need. So everybody wants to be there. And there's a big chunk of space reserved for broadcasting TV over the air. But like we mentioned before, only 14% of the population use those. So the government decide again to auction part of that spectrum and sell that to the telecoms. This was the original transition table so everything started basically in July of 2017, and the first tests started in September of 2018. So now we are basically at, we passed the end of phase seven, we are approaching uh, phase eight, but basically everything is done. You know, in most places, everything is all set. What we still need to do is there's some TVs that they need to move, and some of them are actually not moving because there's not enough antenna crews. So like people who knows how to work with antenna transmitters and stuff like that. Uh, but in most of, especially the big metro areas, we already 
all the TV stations have moved from the 600 megahertz where they used to be above channel 37, they moved below channel 37. So this is what the UHF uh, TV band used to be in the US. So 470 to 698. Uh, so this is basically channel 14 to channel 51. So after the auction, they sold channel 38 to 51 to the broadcast, to the uh, broadband guys, the mobile application. Right. And we kept the 470 to 614 for TVs, wireless microphones, and some other applications. So we have way less space to allocate all the microphones that we need. And not only we have less space, it's a crowded space because some of the TV channels that were empty in the past, now they are occupied by TV channels that moved from a higher channel count to a lower channel count. So this is basically what we have on the UHF TV band now. So if you see 14 through 36, that's the place where we can actually work. 37, we could, you know, it's been, it's been out of our reach for many years. 37 is dedicated to radio astronomy and most important to medical telemetry. So you don't want to mess with that. That's where the nurses get their uh, signal from the, the beds and stuff like that in many hospitals. So um, if you try to, to put frequencies, to put channels into those frequencies, um, our stuff, our wireless systems would not allow you to do that because the 37 is banned from, from our normal tuning bands for many years. So 14 to 36, it's what we can use now. There's this two megahertz thing right above channel 37 that we call guard band that basically um, guards the channel 37, protects channel 37 from interference from the uh, mobile broadband. And there's this duplex gap right between the, uh, the two black chunks of mobile broadband. One of them is the uplink, the other one is the downlink, and they must have 10 megahertz right in the middle. So as you can see, there is not a lot of space above channel 36. So most of the time, 90% of the applications you see on UHF will be between channels 14 and channels 36. What we have to keep in mind is that uh, we still have what we call uh, public safety channels in 13 cities in the US. So all those cities in there, from Boston to DC, uh, they have different channels allocated to public safety. So it's very important for us to know that and not to put any microphone on those frequencies. When you use tools like wireless workbench and you put your zip code, workbench knows that if you are operating on those cities, you cannot put microphones on those channels. So it automatically blocks them. So uh, it's very important to do not interfere with that. So major bands for uh, wireless in North America. So we're going to talk today about UHF, which is the largest band. But you still can do uh, VHF, especially now that a lot of channels actually have left VHF. So depending where you are in the country, VHF may be very um, open and still it's a, it's a possibility. Uh, there's an unlicensed band of 900 megahertz, and we have some um, uh, consumer audio, musicians, consumer audio uh, products that work on that frequency. Um, 1.9 gigahertz, it's called the DAC band, which is a band where we normally use for applications where higher latency is okay. You know, like a conferencing, like video conferencing and stuff. Uh, the DAC band works really well for that. And the 2.4, the good thing about 2.4 is that it's an unlicensed band that anyone can use. 
The bad thing about 2.4 is that it's an unlicensed band that anyone can use. So it's being used by Bluetooth and Wi-Fi uh, and wireless microphones, of course. So uh, it's a very good band to use digital wireless microphones if you don't need a large channel count. If you do need a large channel count, UHF is still the best place. So let's talk a little bit more about spectrum efficiency and all those technical terms. So for those of you not very familiar with an, the anatomy of a TV channel. So this is how, this is a spectrum from channel 14 to channel 20. As you can see, the channels are spaced in chunks of six megahertz. So one TV channel occupies six megahertz. On this spectrum, you can see that channel 14, there's some things in there, but they are not TV channel because channel 14, it's used in this specific case for public safety. So those are probably, you know, fire trucks, ambulances, and, uh, you know, police talking. Um, channel 15 is actually free. Channel 16, 17, 18, and 19 all have TV channels. The amplitude is different. So uh, channel 19, it's closer to the place where this scan was taken than channel 18, then channel 17, and then channel 16. Either they are the, the low amplitude ones are further from the place, or they may be a low power station close by. So channel 20, it's free in this case. So it's important just to, to know that an empty TV channel will be six megahertz wide. So that's uh, Miami after the repack. Miami is one of the busiest places in America after the repack. So as you can see, there's not a lot. You know, we have the 15, the 20th, uh, the 33, the 35, and the 36. You can see the 37 there, but we can't use the 37. So as you can see, there's less space that I can put microphones that are not occupied by a TV channel, right? Um, if you're not familiar to that, if the space is occupied by a TV channel, not only we cannot use because it's not legal, but it also will most likely cause a dropout on your microphone. So you have to use our microphones on places where there's no TV channels. In this case, channel 20 would be a good thing. Channel 15 would be a good thing. And, you know, 33, 35, 36 would be fine. But how many microphones I can pack in there? And how can I access those channels? It depends on the band that you use. So you see in the bottom of the screen for ULXD and QLXD, we have the band, the G50, the H50, and the J50A. So the H50 and J50A, they have some overlap, and the G50 ends where H50 starts. So basically, G50 is channel 14 to part of 24, H50, 24 to part of 35, and J50 starts on 34, 31. And you can see that the 37, there's a red block in there because I cannot use. When I go to Axiom Digital, I use G57+, Plus, which is a very wide band that was designed already to be compliant with the new environment. So basically with the G57+, Plus, I can use all the available spectrum that I have with the exception of the public safety channels. In order to allocate my microphones to the proper spectrum, I need to do frequency coordination. And the more spectro efficient my system is, the easier the task will be. So what is actually frequency coordination? So frequency coordination is basically to find frequencies for all wireless device on the event in order to avoid outside interference and system-to-system -system interference. So there's three important points in that. First of all, definition of outside interference, anything that's beyond my control. 
So it could be a TV channel, it could be uh, some other wireless that are being used and I don't know where they are from, where they're coming from. I see the peaks, I see the interference, but I don't know where. Uh, it could be if I'm working on a hotel room, somebody working on a different room in the same place. It could be a TV crew that is working close by. And the other thing is system to system interference, which means my own microphones must be properly coordinated so they don't create interference themselves. So we're going to elaborate a little more that in a minute. And another super important point is you have to coordinate, you must coordinate all wireless devices for the event. So if you're going to receive some guests in your church and they will bring wireless, you must calculate the frequencies for them. Right. Don't expect that the frequencies that they use will be compatible with the frequencies that you use. Right. We have tools for that. Wireless Workbench is the, it's a fabulous tool for that and it's free. You can download from, from the Shure website. And everything that is not controlled, that you don't coordinate frequencies for them, is considered interference and must be due, you know, that the same way, uh, same way as we would treat a TV channel. So this is what a um, clean um, scan will look like. So this is basically a indoors, like a theater or so. So I have, I don't see a lot of external interference in there, but this is normally what we see when we are outdoors. So I have a lot of TV channels, I have a lot of other microphones, and uh, you know, it gets tricky to find place for my microphones. If you are wondering why I have so many TV channels on that scan, that's because it's an European scan. So they have uh, more channels than we have here. So talking about the system to system thing. One of the first points that I have to keep in mind is how close can I put my microphones to each other? So in my example, if my microphone is at 500 megahertz, how close can I put my next mic? Well, it depends on the type of uh, system you're using, right? On the series of system you're using. If you're using an SLX, you have certain occupied bandwidth. If you're BLX, you have certain occupied bandwidth. If you have QLXD or ULXD or Accent Digital, you all have different occupied bandwidth and different characteristics of how close I can put one mic to, each, to the other. So it's very important not only to calculate the frequency itself, but to know where the frequency will be used, what device will be using those frequencies. And this is something you can find on wireless workbench. There's something called the equipment profile. And within the equipment profile, workbench keeps all the characteristics of every microphone. Not only sure, actually, there's a lot of microphones from other brands there too. So if you want to coordinate and your coordination includes um, other brands, you can actually find those there too. The intermodulation distortion, it's something that is, uh, it's way easier when I can demonstrate that. And if you have a chance to attend one of our master classes, uh, we can definitely demonstrate. But basically when I have two frequencies passing to a not so linear circuit, um, other frequencies may appear. So if you look on the left, I have my main frequencies. So those are, for example, two microphones spaced at 10 feet from each other. On the right hand, I have the same two microphones, but I put them like uh, 10 inches from each other. You see that there's two peaks appearing at the left of the lower uh, frequency and two peaks appear on the right of the higher frequencies, right? So at the good thing about it is there's a way to calculate where they will appear. This is way more perceptive. You can, you can definitely check that out very clearly when you're using analog systems. The digital systems, 
because of the nature of the design, they use way more linear amplifiers. So you actually don't see a lot of the intermods. Normally, when you see something, they are so low in amplitude, they're basically you know, lost on the noise right on the bottom. But on the analog systems, you see them way more. And that affects our spectral efficiency because those peaks that you see there, the extra ones, they are actually taking space that I could use for another microphone because they are not just graphic rendering. They, they actually have energy and they have the modulated signal on them so I could actually hear things if I tune the receiver on those frequencies. So uh, we definitely have to avoid them. And if we have to avoid them, it's less space that I could be using for more microphones. Uh, we did this experiment in our um, downtown uh, office in Chicago, where we put nine analog transmitters in one TV channel, and we put nine digital transmitters in one TV channel. So what you see on the screen from left to right of the, the spectrum analyzer screen, you have 18 megahertz. So you have three TV channels. So the one in the middle has all our wireless. Our nine wireless are on the center TV channel. So when we put the transmitters like in this graph, they are two meters apart, so about a little more than six feet apart. Um, you see that on the analog side, you, you can see some spikes in there, right? You can see some noise on the adjacent uh, channels. On the digitals, you don't see them. But check this out, when I put them 20 centimeters apart, so eight inches apart, the analog gets really busy. So the adjacent channels, they get a lot of noise. So the previous channel and, and the channel after that, they all have noise. So I'm not only messing with the TV channel that I am, but I'm actually messing with my neighbors. So in the other hand, the digitals, because they have way better, like linear, more linear transmitters, you don't see the, the intermodulation products. So this will increase our spectral efficiency because if you think about it, let's say that I, I'm still working on the nine microphones per TV channel. On the left hand, on the analog, I could not use the, the adjacent channels because they are noisy too. On the right one, I could actually put nine more on the channel before and nine more on the channel after. As a matter of fact, the spectral efficiency on the digital systems are at least 15 microphones per TV channel. So I could actually put 45 microphones on the one in the right. And this is working on standard mode not on what we call high definition mode, which is another cool tool that we have on the digital systems. So um, in order to find the right frequencies, right, to find what we call compatible frequencies, every time that Shure or any other wireless manufacturer finish the design of a system, we calculate all the compatible frequencies. So what are compatible frequencies? Are basically frequencies that will not be where an intermodulation product may arise. So those are compatible frequencies. And we group them in groups of compatible frequencies. So when you have, let's say a ULXD, and which is the one that we're showing on the screen, and you do a group scan, it's going to show you how many channels I have available on that group. And it's important that we get all the channels from the same group. If we got all the channels from the same group, it means that all my frequencies are compatible. So I don't have any issue among my own microphones. I may have issues that some frequencies may not be completely clean because someone else, it's on them, like, you know, a TV channel or, you know, an ENG crew or, you know, some TV station. But my own microphones will be compatible. 
The only issue with this technique is that the ULXD doesn't know about the groups of the QLXD. And the QLXD doesn't know about the groups of the UHFR. So if you are using mixed systems, so if you have different, or if you have in-ears and microphones, then this doesn't really work. Then you have to go to a more elaborated process to calculate your frequencies, which is normally involved using a software, which we recommend being the wireless workbench. It's our own tool. Uh, it's free and it's a full feature software. So you can calculate frequencies from, you know, simple four people on a conference room up to a large scale festival with multiple stages and everything. So basically uh, we have a lot of videos on the web. We have webinars uh, that show how to work with a wireless workbench. It's a very intuitive um, system to work. And actually we have um, uh, trainings also for that. So you can go to our training portal and find, you'll find courses for wireless workbench. A very good way to start your frequency coordination is just to look at the frequency finder. When you go to wireless frequency finder or www.sure.com slash frequency, you can put your zip code and it's going to show what TV channels are occupied on that zip code. Keep in mind that at this point in time where there's still some TV stations moving, you know, what you see today may not be what is there tomorrow, right? But everything should be all set in a couple months. But a frequency finder is definitely a good tool to get there and, um, you know, decide what frequency band you're going to use, um, you know, and what is the, you do a kind of an offline basic coordination. So at least you know that you're not landing on top of a TV channel when you get there. The other thing that is definitely can be, if you have any issue and it's working, especially with a high channel count or in a city where everything is changing really fast, just give us a call. Call uh, our system support and uh, we definitely can help you with that. So talking about more resources that we have, um, we have a part of our website dedicated to spectral information. So if you wanna know more about why this whole change happened and what cities were affected at each time and the TV channels that change, you can all get that from our website. Uh, we have a very cool database of, of publications and manuals, which is pubs.sure.com. You need a manual for something, just go there and you can find, um, you can search and find um, all your manuals. Online training, uh, you can use that long URL, but the easiest way is just go to the sure.com, look under support Sure Audio Institute. You go for online training and you're gonna get a link to the portal. You can create an account and take all the online trainings we have there. There's also uh, some very nice Wireless Workbench 6 uh, YouTube videos that they are micro learning. So if you wanna know how to add a device or how to add a backup frequency or how to push the frequencies to your inventory, they are all into those uh, Wireless Workbench 6 videos. The whole Sure website is based on FAQ database. So if you go to the search box and you look for something, you will show also the FAQs, which is basically um, frequently asked questions for many years. So since the system support start logging them many, many years ago, we have all those questions that were really important that a lot of users asked them. So you can get like, you know, how do I change my microphone from a uh, wireless to a wired version? So how can I put an XLR? What kind of uh, adapter do I need? And they are all on our FAQ database. And from time to time, we have instructor-led training, uh, the Masterclass Wireless and some other trainings that you can uh, see them also on the Sure Audio Institute page on our website. With all that said, 
I think now it's time for our questions. Great. We have a couple of questions lined up here. Uh, first question, um, will we be able to send you a 600 megahertz transmitter and have you change out the quote-unquote guts of the unit to another frequency range? Unfortunately not. Uh, this is part of uh, our agreement or with FCC or what the rules of the FCC are is that um, U.S. manufacturers cannot change frequencies of transmitters. So, no, we can't do that. Sorry. Great. Okay, next question. When can we expect to see IEMs move to digital? That's a, that's a very good question, and we get that all the time. Uh, we are always investigating new technologies, but I would say that one of the big things that would impact an IEM when going to digital is that you're going to have another thing with latency on your chain. Right. So that is the big thing with the, uh, with the digital IEMs. We are always investigating, but there's no announcement to be made at this point. Great. Um, speaking of latency, how can you measure and correct latency? Uh, well, measure depending on what you're using. You know, if you're using a, a recording system, you can always use a microphone and an output and you see where those picks, you know, use sort of like, a, you know, claquette, plaque, and then you, you know, just do a percuss percussive or, you know, any uh, slap noise, and you can measure them. Um, correct them, it's not possible most of the time because you can't correct them bypassing some of the gear that is actually adding latency. So let's say that you figure out that you have a, a processor on your monitor that is adding too much latency. If you bypass it, you get better, or you don't use certain plugins and use other plugins that will have better latency, but basically there are things, you know, inherent from the gear that you use, so that's not really a big way to correct them, right? Okay, next question. Uh, does the PA821B use a similar summing and error correction process, and if so, how does the input summing break down, i.e. 1 to 4 to A and 5 to 8 to B? Uh, you're talking about the, 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 the combiner for the IEMs. I right? believe That's, so, yeah. If I'm getting at the PA821B, uh, it's basically, there's no error correction in there because it's pure RF. So the A21, the combiner can be used with both, you know, you know, always use actually with analog systems, but if you use it, as an antenna combining for a receiving system, you can always use this on digital system, but it's pure radio frequency. There's no uh, decoding of any sort inside of the system. Great. Okay, next question. Uh, I used four wireless mics in, recent, in a recent women's panel. When I scanned the channels and rung out the mics, I noticed that when all four mics were turned on, I started getting this weird modulating, no modulating noise that sounded similar to feedback. Is, oh, sorry, hold on, I have to <laughs> scroll down here, um, uh, similar to feedback, heck, sorry, I'm having a little bit of issue with my question panel, give me just one second and I'll finish the question. Um, I believe the question is, was that, is that related to intermodulation or is that something else? Well, intermodulation can generate feedback, especially on uh, analog systems, because what happens is, uh, if you remember when I mentioned that the more you uh, deviate from a center carrier, the louder your system is. And uh, the compending takes care of um, the maximum deviation that the FCC allows us to do. But when the system intermodulates, uh, they actually deviate more. And that makes the signal louder, so it can create feedback. If you found the four channels of mics, if they were the same type of mic and they were in the same group, you were not supposed to have intermods from them, right? Oh. Or it, then it could be audio feedback from a different issue than an intermodulation. Right. And I would say if you do have that issue, I would reach out to our support team. Uh, support team, you can open up a ticket with them at assure.com slash contact. Um, and they can maybe help you troubleshoot that out a little bit more. Yep. 
Okay, next question. Is Wireless Workbench a downloadable software or is it only through the Sure website? Well, it is a downloadable software through the Sure website. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, you can download a Wireless Workbench from our website. If you mean by through the Sure website, it means an online app. No, it's not an online app. It's actually you have to download into your computer and it runs in your computer even if you don't have internet. Right. All right. Uh, next question I'm actually going to take. Uh, it's a comment. The frequency finder has not been working. And actually, it was most recently updated. Um, so it is up and running now. So if you haven't been there recently, go to sure.com slash frequency and it should be up and running. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, compliment that in a, in a way that we, we bring the frequencies from a database. And this database, it's updated by the FCC. So sometimes if it's right in the middle of the change, you may have a slightly difference from what you scan and what you see on Frequency Finder because the database may not be completely updated. Great. Okay, uh, next question. Oh, it was another question about digital in-ears, um, but we already answered that one. Um, okay. Is it correct that QLXD and ULXD transmitters can be used interchangeably with QLXD and ULXD receivers, assuming the frequency bands match up? I understand that high density mode won't be available on the QLXD systems. Uh, yes, you are correct. Uh, it depends on what firmware you're using. Certain firmwares, you will be able to pass audio from a QLXD to a ULXD. Uh, when you do so, it will sound perfectly, no problem, but you won't be able to actually sync them infrared. You have to put them manually on the same frequency, and they will work. Great. Okay. Does encryption add latency, and if so, how much? Uh, the good thing is that encryption does not add latency. Uh, the signal, it's always encrypted. So what the only thing we do is we... Um, enforce or not that encryption. So because it's always there, I don't have to change anything in my transmission when I'm doing the encryption. So it's, uh, it, it doesn't add any latency. Great. When operating Axiant digital transmitters in high density mode, is the change in power level, 10 milliwatts, 2 milliwatts, the only difference? Um, no, not really. Um, the, uh, as you mentioned, you know, when you go to high density mode, we drop the power to two milliwatts on the Axiom Digital, and we actually close the occupied bandwidth and close the channel spacing between them. So this way we can actually pack more with not only with the two milliwatts help us to not have any sort of intermodulation. So we can actually use those spaces and actually decreasing the occupied bandwidth and the channel spacing, we can actually pack them closely so we can achieve 47 mics in a single six megahertz space. Great. Okay, this person is upgrading from ULXS to ULXD. Can they use the same antenna paddles? Assuming, well, most likely yes, uh, assuming that uh, they are both in the UHF. You know, the only difference would be the ULXD is also available on VHF. So, of course, if you go to the VHF, they will not be compatible. But as, as long as you keep on the UHF, yes, the pedals are wideband. So you can definitely use them uh, analog or digital. There's no such thing as a digital antenna. An antenna is an antenna. It hmm. will pick up analog or digital. Great. What resources are available, available to gain a better understanding of the internal electrical hardware of RF systems for audio transmission? Hmm. Well, there's some limitations where we can go with that, you know, especially nowadays, there's a lot of stuff that is actually what I call secret sauce, right? So all <laughs> the manufacturers, they compete to have the best wireless system. So uh, when you go to one of our um, master class, we go a little bit deeper in terms of what the analog modulations are and what the digital modulations are, especially on the digital modulation with, with we discuss different types of modulation schemes and what you should expect from them, but not really into the circuit itself. But most like, you know, circuits nowadays, especially on the digital wireless, it's basically like a big chip 
and everything is inside, right? So it's not, there's not a lot of circuit to be uh, like, like we had on the analog systems. Okay. Here's a good one, um, <laughs> a hot topic. How do I know that the FCC won't reallocate the 470 to 614 megahertz band in the future and force wireless transmitters to change again? Uh, we don't. <laughs> but basically, <laughs> you know, they, they own the thing, so they, they create the rules. What, what we can say is uh, there are many cities now that if they take any action like this, means turning off, shutting down many TV stations because they're so packed. And the other thing is, I think they realize that it doesn't bring as much money as they were expecting. So, and also the need uh, for, the, for the spectrum was not as high as they were expecting. So um, we never know, but most likely not, but, uh, you know, the question is, we don't know. All right. Um, specific to the ULXD J50 band, can we still use the 572 to 599 range without issue, just not the 599 to 636? No. Um, the, uh, the J band is one that is really tricky because part of it is into the, what I call now the legal band and part is on the illegal band. Um, by the FCC rules, if your transmitter can be tuned on a bad frequency or one of the illegal frequencies, that transmitter is illegal. So what we do have, it's an option to band pass it. So uh, you can do a firmware update, which is a one-way process, so you cannot revert it. So we have to you know, think if that's really what you wanna do, but through wireless workbench, and an update of firmware, you can lock the bad frequencies from the J50 band, and we actually send you new stickers saying that you are compliant with the new rules, but you have to uh, basically change the firmware on your device. And it's only for devices that can be firmware updated. So uh, ULXD, QLXD, PSM 1000. Great. Okay. Um, do Digital systems use companding, and are they suitable for measurement microphones? They don't use companding, so, and they are not suitable for a wireless for a measurement system, so for a different, different reason. So um, the fact that they don't use companding is great for measuring systems. The problem is they are not phase coherent. So because we do phase modulation on that, the phase of what's getting in the microphone will be changed from the phase that is out. So if you're using smart or things like that, your phase data would not be that great. Okay. Does it matter where I place the external antennas for IEM and microphones? Can I position it next to each other or should one type be in front of the other, i.e. IEM transmitter antenna in front of the microphone antennas? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, it depends a little bit of the type of antenna you're using. Uh, most likely if you're using a helical antenna for the IEMs, that helical antenna should be in front of the, your microphone antenna. So what you don't want is the IEM to be blasting your, blasting your uh, receiving antennas with too much energy because the IEMs most likely will be transmitting at 100 milliwatts and you are expecting on the microphone antenna to receive something around 10 milliwatts. So there's a big chance for you to overload the front end of your receiver. So um, helical or directional IEM antenna in front, probably about two to three feet in front of your um, wireless receiving antennas. Okay, on the P10R Plus, there is an audio DSP used for EQ limiting, et cetera. Does this add latency? And if so, how much? Uh, it is, it basically does not add any significant latency. Of course, it's a DSP, so a DSP will have, you know, certain latency. It's, it's so small that we don't, we don't measure and we don't publish that number. Okay. Is there a portable active RF analyzer you would recommend? Um, we, you know, 
you you can use basically, especially if you're going to interface with a wireless workbench, you can use anything that can export on a CSV file. Uh, people are using a lot the uh, um, RF Explorer because it's affordable and uh, it works. You just have to tweak it a little bit when you go to wireless workbench, especially on the resolution, so it doesn't show too much noise and stuff. Okay. When using antenna combiners, should they be used with all the same unit, or is it okay to mix and match? For example, combining ULXD and UR4D. Okay, you're talking about, um, uh, we use the term combiner specifically for in-ears, so uh, when you combine the transmission antenna, so you're talking about a distribution amplifier. So yeah. when you receive the two antennas and you send them to uh, different uh, microphone receivers. So if they are in the same frequency band, you can definitely have one QLXD or ULXD in, in one uh, output of your distribution amplifier and have a UHFR on the other one. It's not a problem. The only issue happens when you're using the cascade ports because the cascade ports are filtered to the band. So it's not impossible. You know, you can use, let's say, a ULXD connected to the cascade ports of an Axiom Digital but you should not use the other way around because the ULXD has a narrower band than the Axiom Digital and the cascade port would be filtered to that. Got it. Okay, so what will happen if we try to use a 600 megahertz wireless unit after July 1st, 2020? Uh, well, it depends. Like everything else in audio, it depends. Um, uh, the first, first disclaimer, it's going to be illegal to use. Um, if you happen to have one receiver in that frequency, uh, if you are right on the broadband, you're going to have a lot of noise. So most likely, if you have a cell tower close by, you won't be able to get any um, microphone audio from that. So basically, your noise will be too high that the squelch will kick in and mute the audio. Um, and that's uh, that's basically it. You know, they the, the cell phones will interfere with the microphones. Most likely, not the way, not the other way around. Okay. Um, and unfortunately, we've gone over a little bit, and we still have a lot more questions. Um, we're not going to get to all of them. I'm just going to ask one more. Um, but if your question was not answered and it's just burning a hole in your mind, uh, please feel free to go to shore.com slash contact um, and fill out the form there or send an email to support at shore.com, and our applications engineers can get back to you with an answer. Um, so I'm just going to end it with one last question. Um, it's uh, and it's one that I'm actually going to answer. Is Sure offering rebates, rebates trading on UR4D to upgrade to Axiom Digitals? Um, so actually, we are doing a promotion right now in the United States only uh, for digital instant rebates. So um, on products QLXD, ULXD, and Axiom Digital, there are instant rebates right now. Um, anywhere from 100 to several hundred dollars per channel. You can go to sure.com and on our main page, there is a link that gives you a little bit more information, but we are doing instant rebates right now on digital wireless. All right, uh, that wraps up our time. We wanna thank you so much. Sorry we went over a little bit. Um, we hope that you learned a lot. I know I certainly did, and we hope to see you on the next one. Have a great day. Thanks everybody. Thanks a lot.